On July 21, 1959, Big Boy 4014 rolled out for what would become its final revenue run. Less than two and a half years later, in December 1961, Union Pacific officially retired it after clocking an astonishing 1,031,205 miles. A million miles over two decades of mountain punishment, from the Wasatch to the Cheyenne to Laramie Corridor, and the machine was still fully serviceable, still hauling heavy tonnage, still muscling its way up grades that had defined its wartime glory years. So why kill a locomotive that could still do the job? The truth isn't the story Union Pacific liked to tell. Let's talk about the economics nobody at Union Pacific wanted front and center. Operational data from Union Pacific Mechanical Reports, confirmed by Old Machine Press, show that a big boy averaged roughly 19,487 pounds of coal per hour and about 9,078 gallons of water per hour in sustained service. Put another way, every mile demanded almost half a ton of coal and hundreds of gallons of water. Every. Single. Mile. Historian J. Parker Lamb detailed big boy test figures in perfecting the American steam locomotive, reporting around 20 tons of coal per hour, roughly 100,000 pounds of water evaporated per hour, and about 6,000 horsepower at 40 miles per hour. 20 tons of coal per hour. That is literally a loaded coal truck disappearing into the firebox every three hours. The economics were not just bad, they were becoming catastrophic. But wait, it gets even uglier. In April 1943, Union Pacific borrowed a dynamometer car from Santa Fe to measure big boy performance under controlled conditions on the 76-mile Ogden to Evanston stretch. The test runs revealed that at full throttle, a big boy could devour 11 short tons of coal per hour and drink 12,000 gallons of water per hour. This was confirmed in Union Pacific's own data summaries. 12,000 gallons in an hour. At that rate, a big boy would drain its entire water supply in about two hours and its coal supply in a bit over two and a half hours. Union Pacific's original tenders carried around 56,000 pounds of coal, later increased with steel sideboards to 64,000 pounds, exactly as old machine press documents. Even after that upgrade, sustained full-throttle mountain running meant the tender was gone in mere hours. No exaggeration, no embellishment, just engineering reality. By the late 1950s, the comparison with diesels became humiliating. Union Pacific's frontline road diesel was the EMD GP9, its 567C prime mover producing 1,750 horsepower. On paper, you would need about four GP9s to approach the 6,290 drawbar horsepower recorded from a big boy in the 1943 dynamometer tests. But here is the punchline. Those four diesels did not need a fireman, did not need water stops, did not need ash removal, and did not require constant daily teardown maintenance. Ed Dickens summarized it perfectly decades later while discussing big boy preservation. Steam locomotives are logistical monsters. Fuel, water, lubrication, inspections, thermal stress, thousands of moving parts. A diesel? You turn a key, throttle up, and run for days. That is the difference. And it was not just the locomotives that were dying. The infrastructure was collapsing. In the 1940s and the 1950s, steam engines still relied on water towers and coaling stations scattered along Union Pacific's high traffic corridors. But by the late 1950s and into the early 1960s, a growing number were being decommissioned or dismantled. Every vanished tower was another nail in the coffin for big boy operation. You cannot run a 12,000 gallon per hour machine when the watering points themselves are disappearing. Union Pacific tried extending big boy territory when possible to squeeze every ounce of value out of them. In World War II, they dominated Ogden to Green River. After the war, they reached Cheyenne, and occasionally they were sent farther east or farther south when traffic required it. But by the final years of steam, their territory had shrunk to the Cheyenne to Laramie segment. Even so, Union Pacific periodically adjusted authorized tonnage as track improvements came online, pushing eastbound loads on Sherman Hill toward higher figures, though official Union Pacific ratings stayed lower than the exaggerated tonnages sometimes mentioned. 
Union Pacific was trying to keep steam competitive against diesel in terms of horsepower per dollar, but the gap was already widening. And while Union Pacific was publicly standing behind steam, internally, the replacement plan was already set. The railroad was not going to overhaul its aging 4884 fleet with dieselization sweeping the continent. Then came Union Pacific's gas turbines, whose tonnage performance on the Wasatch was in the range of heavy steam and, in some conditions, competitive with it. The writing was not on the wall. It was carved into the walls of the Cheyenne Roundhouse. Then came the last stand. In the summer of 1959, Union Pacific hauled six of the sleeping giants back into service. First came 4014 out of storage, the locomotive Union Pacific chose for one final season as if the railroad were giving the old warrior one last chance to prove itself. Shortly afterward, 4011, 4015, 4017, and 4023 followed. A few days later, 4019 returned to the roster. Six big boys revived for one last campaign. It felt like the entire steam era was summoning its strength for a final push before the inevitable end. But that last stand was heartbreakingly short. By late July, it was over. First 4017, 4019, and 4023 finished their final assignments and were placed back into storage. A day later, 4011, 4014, and 4015 ran their last revenue trips. In just two days, the heart of the big boy fleet went silent, one final run at a time, each locomotive fading quietly into history. And here is the brutal truth almost no one outside the rail fan world understands. None of these machines were retired because they were worn out. No catastrophic boiler failures, no cracked frames, no terminal mechanical damage. They could have easily run another season. Union Pacific shut them down because the accountants said diesel locomotives were cheaper, nothing more. That is why those last days feel surreal, like watching a championship team benched while still in top form because a more cost-efficient roster just walked in the door. What makes this final phase even more tragic is how quickly the memory of their dominance faded inside Union Pacific itself. Within a year, water facilities were dismantled, coaling towers were removed, and crews were reassigned to diesel shops. The entire ecosystem required to keep a big boy alive evaporated faster than the steam pouring from their safety valves. In less than three years, Union Pacific went from thinking they might need them again to ordering that they be cut up for scrap. That sudden shift tells you everything about the ruthless economic logic of the late 1950s and how little sentiment mattered in corporate boardrooms. They sat in storage, fully serviceable, from July 1959 through August 1961, with four units remaining operational at Green River until 1962. They were held as reserve power, just in case Union Pacific needed them for a surge. But the call never came. Diesels handled every situation thrown at them. Then came the cutting torches. In September 1961, scrapping began with number 4015 at Cheyenne. By the end of that year, 23 of the 25 big boys had been officially retired. Two more followed in 1962. Most were dismantled at Union Pacific facilities in Cheyenne or Green River. Three, numbers 4003, 4010, and 4020 were hauled to a steel mill in Provo, Utah, and cut up in 1963. No ceremony. No hesitation. Once the revenue stopped, Union Pacific wanted the scrap value immediately. Seventeen big boys did not survive. Only eight did. Out of 25 of the most powerful steam locomotives ever built, eight escaped the torch. And yes, Union Pacific records confirm that each of the first 20 big boys surpassed 1 million miles, while the last five accumulated over 800,000. These were not weak machines. Crews respected them, trusted their sure-footed behavior, and appreciated their stability on mountain territory. They were monsters, but refined monsters. But sentiment does not survive an audit. By 1960, diesel economics were overwhelming. Better reliability in all weather, simpler maintenance, higher availability, and dramatically lower fuel and labor costs. Steam was finished, not because it stumbled, but because the operating costs and the cold arithmetic of the ledger made steam impossible to justify. 
The big boys were retired at their operational peak, still hauling heavy tonnage on the grades they were assigned in their final years, and still fully capable of Sherman Hill level work when required, still fully able to work after one million miles of punishing service. But ability does not matter when every mile burns fuel and water like a blast furnace. In 1959, Union Pacific's accountants looked at the numbers. 20 tons of coal per hour. 12,000 gallons of water per hour. Maintenance crews required constantly. Inspections on every trip. Watering and coaling infrastructure disappearing. Then they looked at the GP9. You could simply start it, throttle up, and let it run for days with almost no intervention. The decision was brutally simple. The big boys had to go, not because they were weak, but because they were too expensive to keep alive. They were retired while still powerful, scrapped while still capable, silenced while still supreme. That is the true tragedy of the big boy. They were not replaced because something better outperformed them. They were killed by economics, the most powerful steam locomotives ever built, brought down not by failure, but by a spreadsheet.